Welcome to the final part of the seven and a quarter inch gauge sweep William steam locomotive. This one is part 80. Checking that the saddle tank is watertight by making plugs for the water unions and applying some more silicone sealant to one of the corners. Then making the water filler cap. And before anybody mentions, well, what about the painting? I've already gone into this in a previous episode. I do not have the facility to paint a thing of this size without either asphyxiating myself in the workshop and covering all the tools in overspray or doing it outside in the rain. So the owner and myself came to an agreement that he would paint it because he has the facilities and the space. This episode is a bit back to front to start with. The first thing I did was to make some plugs for these water outlets. Obviously the first job to do was to test whether the tank was watertight and I'm pleased to say, apart from a very slight leak on one corner, it was watertight. Here are the washers I made to fit inside the unions, which act as plugs. I machined a disc to fit in each of the union nuts, then tightened both of the union nuts onto their respective unions. What I wanted to do in the first part of this episode is give the silicone rubber time to cure. I showed that part of the job right at the beginning. And now I'm pretty sure at the rear corner, where the tank meets the cab, there is enough silicone rubber to waterproof it. I was starting to get really paranoid with this job, and I was so pleased when I only got one leak on one corner. It's time now to make the water filler cap. I've taken the dimensions with my caliper, and in this clip I'm fitting this big lump of brass in the four-jaw self-centering chuck in my Smart and Brown lathe. This is quite a large machine and I've had it for many years. It is possible to turn a piece of metal as big as this in a much smaller lathe by fitting the outside jaws in the three jaw chuck, but I didn't want to do that, it seemed pointless as I have a machine that is more than capable of doing this job. A short while ago I made a three part series called Model Engineering A Comedy of Errors. When I made the first episode of the series public on YouTube, the idiot comments started to pour in. What I find a bit odd about some of these comments is some of them will say, he doesn't know how to do this, or he doesn't know how to do that. Why do they use he? They're addressing me directly. When you send a comment into YouTube, it's addressed to me. It does not automatically go onto the channel. I get to see it first. And if it's an aggressive comment, or just from a fool, then I automatically delete it and it goes no further. On this model engineering comedy of errors series, so many people entirely missed the point. To start with, I selected a piece of metal bar that I thought was cast iron, or oh, that's what I said in the video. I knew full well it wasn't cast iron. I knew exactly what it was, a very low grade piece of steel. Once more, I will reiterate, these are tutorials designed for beginners and intermediates. And on the quiet, I really do know what I'm doing with this job. I've been doing it for a lot of years. I'm not the best machinist in the world. I never wanted to be. For instance, in this clip, I'm doing something really simple. I'm showing that it's not a good idea to go straight through the work with a one inch drill in one pass. This is not a very good idea. A far better idea is to drill a slightly shallower hole first and then enlarge it with the one inch drill. Here's a rare occurrence, I'm cleaning my machines because this brass is everywhere. It's currently all down the front of my fleecy too. Although in this clip, I've already brushed that away. Back to the model engineering comedy of Edda's series. Some viewers also noticed that the tool I was using was blunt. And a few of the comments went something like, and he's also using a blunt tool. And my reply really is, yes, I'm using a blunt carbide tip tool on a terrible piece of metal and I'm getting a terrible finish. This job is a bit different. I'm getting quite a good finish. By the way, in this video, it's not a good idea to take note of the speed that I'm cutting at because everything is running at an accelerated speed. In this clip, I'm using the same negative rake carbide tip tool that I used to cut the horrible piece of metal in the Comedy of Errors video. 
And even though it's a bit blunt, I'm still getting a good enough finish for what I need it to be. In reality, the machine is running quite a bit slower than this, but still the chips are flying a long way. It's a good idea to use a piece of cardboard or even a piece of paper to deflect the chips away from you, the operator. You can, of course, use a vacuum cleaner and vacuum the swarf as it comes off the tool, but I've never thought this to be a terribly good idea. I've taken the part out of the chuck now and I need to cut it to size using my bandsaw. Initially I'm running it at the normal speed and now the video really is running fast at 20 times speed. This is quite a low budget bandsaw, I've owned it for many years and it's never let me down. My friend Andrew has the same machine with a different manufacturer's name on it. I think that's enough for the bandsaw sequence. I put the part that I cut on the bandsaw back in the chuck. This time it's in the chuck of my Boxford lathe and it's turned round the other way. I'm holding the part by the bit that's going to fit in the hole on the tank. This is 100% freehand turning and if you want to know how to do this, see if you can buy an etcher sketch. It's a toy with two knobs on it and you rotate the knobs and it draws on the screen. All you need to do is buy an etch a sketch and draw a circle on the screen, followed by diagonal lines. And after a while the penny will drop, you rotate the knobs at different rates depending where you want the stylus to be that just wipes aluminium dust off the inside of the screen. I'm turning the top slide wheel and the saddle wheel at the same time. And eventually I get something that looks like this. This is in its raw state. Once I work down the grades of emery cloth, finishing off with different grades of wet or dry sandpaper, it looks like this. Quite pleasing to the eye, and 100% improvised, no drawings required, no measurements required, possibly a little more polishing would be good. Some viewers may be wondering why I bored out the centre. Well, that was just to lighten it because in its normal state, if it was solid and you dropped it on your foot, it could be a problem. Or also, if it was dropped onto the tank, a large dent would appear. The final turning job of the day is nothing to do with the filler cap. I'm going to make four washers that will fit on the studs that are sticking out of the underside of the tank before being fitted with some 2BA nuts. Once again, this is freehand turning. I used the centre drill and a 3 16ths of an inch diameter drill which is clearance size for 2BA and then I just used the parting tool to part off four washers. How did I get the right size? Well I looked at the parting tool and copied the thickness of that by eye. And here they are before I cleaned them up. All more or less the same size. Time now to go back in time and have a look at the locomotive before I received it. And here it is with the massive side tanks. And it actually looks better here than it did when I first got it. It had water gauge protectors, but they weren't with it as I received it. The overall look of this locomotive I thought was terrible. But now, after quite a lot of work, some of which was quite difficult, it looks like this. This is the filler cap that I've just made. Here's a different angle of the filler cap that I've just made. I painted the first boiler band with some satin black paint, and I think this looks quite nice. This is Humbrol enamel satin black paint, yet the main boiler and smoke box are painted with HMG paint satin black, which is actually closer to matte than satin. Here I've temporarily fitted the whistle in place, and I think it's looking quite good now. The tank is as accurately positioned as I can get it, and by that I mean it is positioned accurately. Once I'd screwed in the centre part, it did distort slightly. But it's now bolted to the cab and bolted to the brackets, and it's sitting there all looking good, all the fittings are in place. Just one more thing to have a look at. I've temporarily fitted an oversized O-ring underneath the filler cap. I've actually grooved the inside part of the filler cap to take an o-ring of the right size. And I've drilled a hole in the top to let some air in, because it's very important. 
The pumps will pump the air out and you do not want a vacuum in your saddle tank. An O-ring is a good idea because it stops the cap from rattling about, or even worse, bouncing out of the tank. And that is it, my part of the job is complete, and this episode concludes the series. The owner says he will send me some photographs of it when he starts running it in steam, and with a bit of luck, some video too. Stay safe, stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Main Steam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.